On today's episode, I'm chatting with Master Sergeant Juan Lopez Jr., an Explosive Ordnance Disposal Project Officer. EOD supports operating forces by providing force protection to include locating, assessing, identifying, rendering safe, neutralizing, and destruction of foreign and domestic hazardous materials. Welcome to the show. Yes, hi, thank you for having me. I'm gonna dive right in so that we can start talking about EOD. Tell me a bit about your team's mission and what your role entails as a project officer. So my team's mission here at CISCOM, it's more or less to supply the EOD techs on the field with the equipment they need to either locate, assess, or render safe any explosive threat out there. Would that be on land and in water? Right now with the new, you know, 2030 construct and the Marine Corps moving more, uh, going back on ships, dealing with the tour rules, the Marine Corps EOD program is doing a huge shift from being more or less strictly land-based systems to now incorporating a lot of near surface, surf zone um, equipment. So it'll be here in the next few years, you'll see more of a diverse where Marine Corps is truly more or less a master of all domains. What's your role as a project officer? So my role as a project officer is to take a requirement and being the active duty EOD SME in the team is to more or less interpret the requirement into more or less where it says like a robot needs to be able to lift 250 pounds over a certain distance. And it's my responsibility to tell the team, the actual logisticians engineer, what does that actually mean? And what does having that capability affect the actual operator of the system? In the beginning, but how long have you been in the EOD community? So I joined the Marine Corps in 2005, and I moved to EOD in 2010. Okay, so a good bit. How have you liked it? Loved it. I absolutely loved it. The only bad part was getting promoted out of it. So what is that? So you won't be working in the field anymore? Will you just, no. you'll be, okay. Just unfortunately, you know, with any job, Work it in enough, you become administrators. You become the SME. Yep. We need that expertise here. How does EOD go about supporting the warfighter? Uh, so EOD's primary mission out there is to provide force protection in one way or another, whether it's you know, either advising the commander where, hey, we know we have this piece of ordinance or this threat, and then interpreting to lingo that he understands where, let's say, hey, there's IEDs all over the field here. What does that actually mean? Well, that actually means you can't drive vehicles on this road. You can't walk on this sidewalk. And we just interpreted the threat to an actual action item a commander can take for action and make policy. Let's talk a scenario mm -hmm. so that I completely understand. Let's say that we're coming up on the shore. We're riding up. Would we then send one of the systems from your team out to look into the water to determine if there are any mines or anything out there? Or is there a another system that senses them before we get that close? Water is a tricky subject. Or land. we're still, so land. Okay. Okay, so a lot of the times, so like let's say in an initial assault, unfortunately a lot of those kind of threats are bypassed. You're familiar with the metal detector that was very prevalent in the first, in the two wars. And let's say if we were to sweep every single inch we were moving, we're never really getting anywhere. There's a level of, you know, of risk the commander has to take in order to actually advance. So where we would come in is just advising that commander, I guess, what is an acceptable level of risk? Where we could say like, hey, like, hey, there's IEDs out there, we can't stop them all, but if you employ, let's say, this jamming equipment, you can at least limit some of them. So if you so go yes. with this, you take this route with the jamming equipment, you're more likely to be safer than if you trample through a field, let's Correct. say. Okay. What would you say is the primary need for the fleet right now in regards to EOD? Primary need just make everything lighter, better, faster, stronger. Yeah. You know, I guess the typical everything everybody wants where technology is evolving very fast and with EOD, we're responding to threats. So let's say, okay, I say in Iraq, like let's say if they had a radio shack over there, the, about the level of threat we would have had would have been much bigger than just, hey, don't watch where you're stepping. Where if let's say they had a radio shack, like, hey, I want to put an Arduino like controller on something. So now the threat is just exponentially just tougher and harder to find. So what I would say the EOD techs really need is just like advanced technologies to be able to know that there's a threat out there or how to find the threat, different levels of PPE, 
to, you know, protect it, whether it's bomb suits or, you know, different clothing to actually keep people cool, just specialized equipment to render safe devices. Does our program office also um, procure the protective equipment, or do we focus on the hardware software itself? Uh, both. Both? So we do provide EOD with bomb suits, okay. and then also different PM shops do provide, you know, the flag Kevlar, the fire retardant clothing. So Like the, I- both, the yes. individual armor is a different, yeah. Yes. Okay. But we do provide them, our PM, with like the bombs, the EOD 10 bomb suit. So how does your team engage with the operating forces? Do you get feedback from them often? Well, I get feedback from them almost daily. (laughs) Which is good. Some (laughs) unwanted. But there's different means, you know, the official route where, you know, through our building plans, our supply instructs, the AMHS. Every year we have the uh, EOD OAG that's down in Florida where we just brief everyone, this is what we're doing, the direction we're going, and when can they expect to get their stuff. And then also the unofficial route where they just call my cell phone. They're like, I know most of them at this point. They're like, hey, my stuff's broken. How do I fix it? Or They're like, like Master hey, Sergeant, I'm, help. Yeah, or <laughs> like, hey, we need some money for testing or yes. something random. But like we keep in constant contact. And feedback, like a lot of it is just, you know, they call me and they just tell me like, hey, this went wrong with this equipment. Or like, hey, this robot you fielded, it. The box is pinched this cable. Like, this might need to get looked at. So that would be more of the unofficial. Official would be through our reporting system, where we use the EOD information management system to uh, write reports, and then all of the EOD knows, like, hey, there is something wrong with X. So the entire community can Correct. log in and see that. Correct. That's great. Is, and that's CAC enabled? Yes. Yes. Okay, just making sure. We know EOD is extremely dangerous uh, and a complicated occupation, What type of technologies is your team looking at that's going to help the fleet? So a lot of the technologies we're looking at is mainly autonomous systems and systems that we can push out to the, you know, every Marine out there. I mean, there's 180,000 Marines. There's only 800 Marine EOD techs. So having an EOD tech everywhere, it's not really a realistic thing. Kind of like going back to the first two wars. One of the things that really helped us and kept people alive was like the CMD, where it wasn't an EOD tech out there doing the searching. It was whatever team leader going out for a squad. They found something, confirm it, and then letting us us know. And then that more or less allows the commander to play and choose where they're going to put the EOD techs and what to respond to first. Because then, you know, 800 EOD techs can't be everywhere. Yeah. Kind of the same idea with autonomous systems where we're able to cover a larger area, but no real personnel, maybe an operator, and then they're relaying the information to a new EOD tech to interpret and then triage it whatever way it needs to. There's less risk when we're using an autonomous system. The survivability of the Marine is higher Uh, if we're sending a robot out versus... Correct. I mean, you're blowing up a piece of metal at the end (laughs) of the day. Same thing with our robotic systems. Yeah. Like, yeah, let's send this, you know, robot down. Yeah, it might blow up, but the person goes home. It makes me think of, um, have you ever watched the show SWAT? No. Uh, it's like any cop show, but they will send in the the EOD technicians, and it's always like, this, you know, mm-hmm. the little robots that then go to the door with the hand and yeah. pick it up. Um, so I just think of that out on the battlefield. Um, can you tell me a bit about y'all's specific systems such as the Leon family of systems and um, I've also heard rumblings about the remotely operated vehicle. Yes so with Leon uh, we actually just got the requirement pushed down to us not too long ago where we were working off an Arson. What's the Arson? Rapid statement of needs. Okay. So now it's actually developed into a full program. So the thing with Leon it's more or less Translating what we could do easily on land, where locating, assessing, diagnosing, and then rendering safe, like that same capability, but in the sea. All right. Where with Leon systems, we have different means to do that, because obviously it's in water. You're not really just playing in a two-dimensional plane. It's like stuff floating at different levels. First, with Leon, you have to be able to find it. Like the ocean is massive. It's huge. And 
more or less, you can't really see that far either. So incorporating a lot of these autonomous systems, like the Remus 300, where there's like this autonomous robot goes, swims, does grid squares, comes back with, hey, there is 50% chance there's something here, right? So then going towards and then another system. So be like, all right, let's send the ROV, where it's that one has, is manipulated by a person, can go diagnose and like, all right, I have something here. And then going further to Leon, where now we need a person in there to deal with it. So it's a dive equipment. So then okay. put him a bomb for a dive suit and then goes deal with it. I didn't even think about having to send Marines down in the water mm-hmm. to yeah. deactivate a, a bomb or mine. In the well, it's the same like on land yeah, where yeah. you try to be remote as possible, where there's steps to take to prosecute any explosive hazard, where if you can go remote first, you stay remote. Hence why we have, you know, what was very popular, the Talon or the SUGV or the RONs, uh, robotic platforms where we send the robot down until it can't go anymore. And okay. once it's stuck, died, can't do the job, that's when you, if you can, put the person in a bomb suit, have them go down. It's the last choice. But yes. Okay. And same with Leon, where if we can, stay around autonomous, go uh, like with the ROV, and then if not, get a guy in a dive suit, put him in the water. Oh, so are Leon systems actually ROVs, yeah, technically? I mean, I mean, ROV is just like any, anything, anything that's operated remotely, a remotely oh, operated vehicle. vehicle. Okay. So like an RC toy is an ROV. How has EOD evolved since you've been in the field? When I came into EOD in 2010, IEDs were the biggest threats out there where most of the fatalities in Afghanistan and Iraq were from IEDs. Luckily, we got to a point where I believe it was 2013 where the, for the first year IED wasn't like primary reason of deaths. Oh, wow. So what I see in EOD more or less transition, it's back to where kind of like our name is, Explosive Order Disposal. We more or less went back to our original mission to dealing with explosive ordnance and disposing of it. Preventative yeah. versus. Yeah, so it's more, I like guess, going back to our original jobs that we had pre OIF. Okay. To where, I mean, before OIF, we only had a 300 personnel and then we grew to 800. So what I have seen is almost like every other field out there kind of have a identity crisis and try to find out where are you guys going to, where, where do you fit? And with 2030 and Little Toros being a huge push, luckily that did give us a niche and have a need. So like, all right, now we need to have divers. We need all this new equipment. And one thing Marine Corps EOD is, excels to the other services EOD is our ability to exploit and inert, which is more or less we go name a country, we find this piece of ordnance that's never been seen before, and we more or less take it apart, figure out how it works, collect data, report it. So are all EOD technicians now trained in diving as well, or do they no. have special? So Marine EOD itself does not pipeline through the dive school and the EOD underwater course. Okay. So they're working on that, and I think there's been one or two that actually have done that pipeline. But as of right now, it's a lot of like volunteers because EOD is a full, fully uh, volunteer MOS. So we need to first like someone needs to get promoted to corporal, volunteer to be EOD, volunteer to be a diver, volunteer to go be in Leon. So it's one of the, it's a it's a process to get just to, to that get point. them to that point. Unfortunately, there's. Right now, we definitely don't have enough there. It's like we're working on it. Like I say, it's just something that's going to take time. Are you trained in diving? No, no. I am not. Like, I, I would be terrified. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, with the amount of time I have left in the Marine Corps, me trying to go dive would more just waste a seat. You've brought up force design a few times, and Marines are now going to be required to fight in a contested environment with limited resources and connectivity does that change the way you think about eod yes in a sense just being resupply luckily for marine eod we've always worked light 
compared okay. to the other services where like for an army team you don't I mean you get a whole truck with logistics tied to it the marine eod at least especially now where like hey whatever you can carry in your backpack and get on an osprey like that is your support lighter the better so like yes it changes a bit so one of our jobs for, for me in acquisition is like i need to shrink that and make it make it lighter I, I see it yes it'll change it as it will force everyone to be lighter we're always talking about partnerships and i'm going to say that your team definitely partners and works with the Navy as we are mm -hmm. with working with, we are part of the Navy. But do you work with any of the other services? Yes, mm -hmm. constantly. So we're actually directed by a DOD instruction of 5160 to work with the other PMs. Just uh, earlier this month, we had a joint like program office like, symposium in D.C., where the Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, we discuss what are we doing, like what are we pursuing to get, and that allows the other service to also jump on whatever program we are. So, because a lot of money is always wasted on, on research and development on things that, let's say I'm looking for the latest and greatest, let's just say metal detector again, and the Army's doing the same thing, like that's just r and &E money getting wasted. So we'll just, like, at these venues, we can discuss, like, hey, we're both doing this. Let's consolidate. Army has lead or we have lead. And that frees up some money to go research something else. Kind of like how we did with JLTV. Yeah. We both use the same vehicles. Correct. I know we work closely with industry here. Is there anything that you would like to see from them? What I would like to see from them, advanced technologies, lighter, better, faster, stronger, Universal battery would be my main thing that I would want to see, where everyone always has their proprietary battery, which, I mean, I can understand. There's, like, this advanced equipment out there has very specific needs of the power output, which I, can, I understand. But at the same time, like, when I had to carry my robots, my X-ray, my jamming systems, and they all have their own unique battery, having to have specific batteries for stuff more or less it limits me as the operator what I can prioritize for power. So let's say like the jammer, I know I can use it for four hours, but my robot I can only use for two hours. Well, it should be my job as an operator, like, no, I'm going to sacrifice some of my power and the jamming capability to go to my robotics. But with unique batteries, I can't really do that. Because they all take yeah. their own battery. Yeah, so it's more or less the manufacturer took that decision away from me. Or it's, I carry more batteries. Which is heavier. Yeah, but just four. The battery is like the most, I guess, is the heaviest part of any component. So that's, that would be my biggest request to the industry is standardize a battery. You mentioned jamming and x-ray. Are, are those part of your team as well? X-ray, yes. We currently fill the uh, disco x-ray, or as the Marine Corps knows, the expeditionary x-ray system. Okay. Which allows uh, an EOD tech to fire, you know, pulses of x-rays through a device, collect them through a panel, and they get sent to a tablet where the user can interpret this is what's in whatever package. The jammer that we currently employ, it's the Modi 2. That's handled by another PM, but I mean, as techs, we don't just, I don't just provide gear specifically to EOD. You know, we get support from other PM shops, like the crew or the Seaburn, that they provide equipment to our guys as well. Especially the suits. I'm sure Correct. you work closely with Seaburn. Correct. Yeah. Now that we've heard all about EOD, let's hear about you. We can start at the beginning. Where are you from and how'd you end up in the Marine Corps? So I'm originally from Arlington, Texas. I joined the Marine Corps because I didn't know what the Marine Corps was. <laughs> so I was, you know, first generation born in the United States. I thought everything was the Army at that point. So I thought, yeah, whatever, there, there's the Army, yeah. like on a boat. It's but all I, the same. Yeah, I thought it was the same. I didn't really know what the Marine Corps was until I was in boot camp, like week three or four. And that's kind of how I think it must have been like a weekend, and they just happened to be the only ones open. So that's... I've Probably. heard that a lot. But yeah, but I mean, growing up in Texas, I always, yeah, you know, I was the firstborn in my generation. I always knew I was going to 
serve in some capacity. I love that. I'm my family's from Texas too. We're from like the Dallas Fort Worth area. But I never go back. <laughs> yeah, I haven't been there in like eight years. Why did you choose to volunteer for EOD? So I wanted to do something, I guess, exciting. When I first joined, I was an aircraft rescue firefighting specialist where I thought, Man, I want to go fight all these fires on airplanes. But you don't hear of a lot of plane crashes, luckily. Yes. So I remember working on the airfield and we had this F-18 come with um, hung ordnance. And I remember like I was in my P-19 fire truck just waiting and EOD shows up and there was like, I don't remember what it was, but they just caught it a bomb hanging from the, from the aircraft. And they came in and someone just got on there, all fours and just started pushing it upwards so they can put a pin through it. I was like, yeah, I want to do something cool. You're like, that looks exciting. Yeah. So next thing you know, like, hey, like, I tried out for EOD and it got accepted. How do you try out for EOD? It's a pretty long process, but like as anything, you start with going with your uh, career planner and they give you the EOD screening checklist. And with that, you know, you have to have a first class PFT, CFT, be in high weight standard, have a GT score of 110 or higher. And then there's a few tests in there, like the bomb suit agility test to make sure you're not claustrophobic. Uh, to make sure you can retain information, so like while you're running and doing stuff in the bomb suit, they'll tell you like, hey, what's this car? Like, oh, it's an Ace of Spades. So like, all right, five minutes later, what card was it? Like, all right. Uh, they'll give you like, here's a piece of equipment. It'll be an EOD, let's say like the firing device with an instruction. And like, hey, here's the manufacturer's instruction. Make this work. Because a lot of our job is just, can you read instructions? To take it apart. Yeah. yeah. So, like, and that's how you try out. And then you go through a panel, they say yay, nay, and then you go to school. And the rest is history. Yeah. And now here you are. EOD seems like it is high stress, even here at SESCOM. Um, is there anything you like to do when, to relax? Oh, man, to relax? I mean, if I was still operational, I would just, let's go to the range and look for stuff. Like, there's nothing more relaxing than... Like here in Quantico, where I luckily got to do a couple of rain sweeps, and you're just walking, and they're like, hey, look, I see, you see tail fins coming out of the ground. You have no idea what it is. All right, well, I'm going to take my life into my own hands and find what the, what this is. I, I don't know. To me, it's so relaxing knowing, like, I'm there digging through the dirt. Like, what am I digging on? Is it just tail fins from the loom round that just got kicked out? Like, is there high explosives underneath this? And to me, that's... Oh, it's relaxing knowing like, oh, this is like you're about to learn something or you're really about to learn something. <laughs> it kind of sounds like you're an adrenaline junkie. <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't say that either. I okay. mean, uh, also like I love to go for a run. If I ever get stuck on something, I'll go run somewhere. Have you ever jumped out of an airplane? Yes, yeah, several. Yeah. I've done a, a couple skydives. Yeah, but. yeah. I've never done that. Don't think I will. Are there any... Hidden talents? I mean, I can, I, mean, I can woodwork pretty well. I have a 1963 Volkswagen bus that I keep running. I want to say I'm talented at it, but I can <laughs> do it. Have you, like, rebuilt all the engine and I've all of that? I've rebuilt the engine, done the interior. What color is it? It's white and seafoam green. Pretty. Where can we find you when you're not here at Syscom? I'm normally either... Running, so like I live by Government Island, I just go back and forth over there, or I like to mountain bike, so some trail somewhere, hopefully not knocked out, and at home watching TV. What do you like to watch? I watch a lot of Simpsons, but I don't really care what's on. I just have it on. It's background noise. Yeah, I've never watched The Simpsons. Oh, wow. I wasn't allowed to watch yeah. it as a kid. That's impressive, actually. I know. <laughs> Maybe one day. It's been on my list, but now there's so many seasons that I'm like, how could I ever catch up? Now we're going to do the most exciting part, the lightning round questions. Um, if you could have an unlimited supply of anything, what would you get? I guess more buses. Volkswagen buses? Yeah, more yeah. Volkswagen buses. Good choice. 60s. Um, are you a morning person or a night owl? Morning person. I wake up every morning at 4. I normally go to bed close to 8.30. 
Favorite TV show, book, movie, or podcast? TV show, The Simpsons. I don't really listen to podcasts. I mean, I listen to a couple of this ones. So I guess this one. Books, I would say. I mean, I read a lot of like Japanese. Like, what was the last one? Like, I read. Last thing I wrote was the Attack on Titan series. Oh, manga. Mm-hmm. Okay, I've seen that one. I haven't read that one. And is there a song that makes you happy, or a band? Band, I would say Hotel Apache. Or Common Kings and J Boog. Well, that was it. That was my last question. <laughs> thank you for coming on. No, yep, thank you for having. Me. This was fun. Yes. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Equipping the Core. Don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcasting platform or on social media. We'd love to hear from you.